course, China is on everyone's mind. You know, this is the great geopolitical relationship of the 21st century, and we have to get it right. And the reason I believe tech is so important is because that's where the great power competition is joined, always. The countries that have the technical edge tend to lead the world. When I hear our members of Congress and, and really people of both political parties talking about China, there's this underlying aura of fear and anger and it feels like we're in a defensive crouch. And that's not how the United States has ever won. We win by being more magnanimous, more open, bigger. We've done this before. <laughs> you know, we won the Cold War. We sent people to the moon. We're capable of this. Welcome to Straight Talk, a podcast about big ideas featuring candid discussions with some of the world's foremost thinkers and doers. I'm Hank Paulson, chairman of the Paulson Institute, and today I'm speaking with Anya Manuel. Anya is co-founder and principal of Rice, Hadley, Gates, and Manuel LLC, a strategic consulting firm that helps U.S. companies navigate international markets. From 2005 to 2007, she served as an official at the U.S. Department of State responsible for South Asia policy. She is the author of the critically acclaimed book, The Brave New World, India, China, and the United States, and is a leading expert on many of the technology policy issues that are at the core of U.S.-China tensions today. Anya, it's great to have you on the podcast. I've been following your work for several years now and have found you to be one of the clearest and most insightful thinkers on the intersection of U.S.-China relations and technology policy. So I'm really looking forward to our discussion today. And I'd like to begin with you. Tell our listeners about your upbringing and how it shaped your worldview. You went to Stanford for undergraduate and then Harvard Law. Who were some of your earlier mentors and what did you learn from them? Yeah, thank you so much, Hank, for having me on. I really enjoyed our conversations about China policy and tech and China over the years. So I feel really honored to be on this podcast. And it's nice to start from the beginning. And, and the last few weeks have made me really think about it because I was one of the people inspired to go into public service for two reasons. One, I have two grandfathers who fought on the opposite sides of World War II, an American one and a German one. And it sort of teaches you the futility of war and that you know humans don't actually wanna make war on each other. And sometimes policymakers do bad things to get us into these. I also grew up in a diplomatic family and my father was stationed in Pakistan when I was young. So I went to elementary school in Abbottabad, which is the borderlands where they finally found Osama bin Laden in 2011. And so I've always been interested in foreign policy, studied it in college, was lucky enough to have Condoleezza Rice as my advisor at Stanford and one of my earliest mentors in this. And then of course went into the State Department after 9-11 to serve. So everything that's happening with Pakistan and Afghanistan and the refugees feels particularly poignant because of course I grew up in elementary school having Afghan refugees from the Soviet conflict living in my backyard. So this feels deeply personal. Oh my goodness, you know that, there's nothing like living abroad. And, you know, I felt that when I was running Goldman Sachs and I was on an airplane all the time and visiting all of these countries around the world that I got a real education, but I've never lived in a foreign country. And yeah. living there, I think, just gives you a totally different experience and one that's hard to duplicate if you haven't done that. So now to your career, and you've touched on this, but before you were a diplomat, and a foreign policy expert. You were an investment banker, and of course you're a lawyer. Um, two of my bosses at Goldman Sachs, like you, had a law degree. What led you to go to law school? And what did you learn from your career in investment banking? Why did you go to law school? Why did you go to Wall Street? 
And then you've touched on it, but talk about the change to foreign policy and when you begin to get really interested in US-China relations. Yeah, thank you so much. Well, of course you were an investment banker at the absolute highest levels. I went into investment banking, if I'm honest, because when I was a graduating senior at Stanford, most of the women were applying for consulting jobs and the men were applying for investment banking. And I thought, I can do this too. <laughs> so it was a little bit of a feminist statement. <laughs> and actually, I really wanted to go to London because, of course, I'm German and I have this international background. And, you know, Goldman, <laughs> now we'll get personal, Goldman hired me but said, you know, you need to do a year, at least one or two years in New York before we'll send you to London. Solomon Smith Barney said, we'll send you to London right away. So I spent a year there privatizing banks in the Czech Republic and steel yards and Poland and mergers of German banks. And it was fascinating, but I ultimately decided pretty quickly that finance wasn't for me. It wasn't scratching the policy itch that I wanted. And it also helped me think through that I really wanted to work with people who were kind, motivated by public service, and whose intellect was far, far bigger than their egos. And so that's actually what led me to start law school. I knew I wanted to do foreign policy. I didn't think I wanted to get a PhD. And so law school felt like a really good discipline. And I was incredibly lucky to right after law school, join a law firm called Wilmer Cutler at the time, one of the great Washington firms led by Lloyd Cutler. And I was able to work for him directly on issues of great public policy import. So we worked on forced and slave labor reparations of World War II. I, have, I tangentially worked on some of the Nazi Swiss gold cases because, you know, of course I was fluent in German. And then I worked on a Supreme Court case on campaign finance reform where we represented McCain and Feingold. So I had one of those extraordinarily lucky careers where I got to do public policy really from the private sector and then, as we already talked about, my old mentor, Condi Rice, became Secretary of State. I had just become a U.S. citizen, and she said, would you like to come work for me? And of course, I, I jumped at the chance to do that. So I've been enormously lucky, and I'll say that to kind of the young folks listening to this podcast. A career is all about serendipity, so you need to just know kind of the broad direction of what you're interested in, what you want to go into, and then the rest you know, sometimes it's luck and sometimes it's less luck and it'll come out fine in the end. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's hard to be a career engineer, right? It, it is. <laughs> and almost as important as what you do is whom you do it with. That's right. And, you know, law is one thing. Working with Lloyd Cutler is something else altogether. And that had to be fascinating. You know, just to digress a moment. So you must have been at Solomon right after the wall came down. And when, when you looked at the privatizations all across Eastern Europe and in Germany, and I remember we'd had a, an exchange student in our home in 1989, whose name was also Anya, Anya Heppel, and she was from Berlin. And so we sat there with my daughter and Anya watching, you know, tears streaming down her eyes when the wall came down. And then I remember going back with my daughter and this exchange student and walking across Checkpoint Charlie and going to the Pargamon, which I'd always wanted to see. But, yeah. but it's yeah. just, just amazing the change that happened in that country in a short time. And so you got to, to witness that. You That's know? right. And you know how good policy stewardship had a positive outcome there. You could have easily imagined a war in the heart of Europe. But you know, Germany managed to absorb Eastern Germany, became part of NATO. I think we sometimes underestimate, in retrospect, how hard those things were to get right and how it, it was not inevitable that it all went as well as it did. Amen. But now let's talk about something else that's very hard to get right. And it's not inevitable that it's going to work out. And that's U.S.-China policy. You've been a leading voice on many of the tech policy issues that are at the heart of U.S.-China tensions. Let's start with the basic here. What is the role that emerging technologies are playing in this relationship? 
What are the key technologies the U.S. is focused on with respect to China? And why are they causing so much friction? Yeah, thank you for asking about that. Of course, China is on everyone's mind. You know, it's been pushed off the front pages a little bit in the last couple of weeks. But this is the great geopolitical relationship of the 21st century, and we have to get it right. And you've done so much personally to make sure that happens. And the reason I believe tech is so important is because that's where the great power competition is joined, always, not just now, you know, from Roman roads, Chinese gunpowder, British steamships, the countries that have the technical edge tend to lead the world. And the US and Europe have been uncontested leaders in technology for the past seven decades, really since World War II. Now China is coming up and becoming a real competitor. And I think it's important to realize that it's not all technologies because sometimes we draw this competition too broadly. But I believe that there are a few key technologies where it's important for the West, uh, the US and our friends to continue to stay in the lead. And let me say a word about what they are. One is semiconductors. These are the chips that go into everything from your smartphone to your computer to increasingly your thermostat, your car, everything. It's the building block for everything else we do in IT. And so we just need to stay in the lead. That's one. Two, artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is talked about a lot. It's a very broad category of technologies. And I think the way to think about it is like electricity or the steam engine was to everything else, because it'll enable so much else that we're doing in tech. So that's why artificial intelligence is important. Finally, 5G and 6G increasingly, because that is the infrastructure on which everything else will run. So right now, your smartphone probably works beginning to on a 5G network. But increasingly, it's not just your smartphone. It's going to be everything you do, including all the self-driving cars. And as someone said to me when, you know, they were trying to understand why is it so important for the West to stay in the lead? Why are we bullying countries to say, don't use Huawei, use Western rails for 5G and 6G? And the answer is because really, if someone controls all of that backbone infrastructure, they can eventually make all the self-driving cars run off the road, right? There's a lot that you can do if you own that system. So that's why 5G and 6G is so important. And fourth, and this one is less talked about, but of course, you're the foremost expert, payment systems and financial technology. Here, the Chinese are really far ahead what they've done with Alipay, WeChat Pay, Ant Financial is genuinely impressive. They've really leapfrogged the West. Uh, what they're doing now with the digital yuan is becoming important. It's not there yet. But in the West, we've been a little slow and we are sometimes killing our own companies there through regulation, well-meaning regulation, but we're not thinking through carefully that this is a strategic issue. So those are the four. A fifth one, of course, is certain aspects of biotechnology, and then farther out is quantum. But those are the four I would focus on now. Yep. And today, Anya, the Biden administration is still debating the path forward for implementing various technology restrictions, including the various export controls that are going to be used and the way in which technology will be restricted domestically and in supply chains. What are the trade-offs involved in implementing these restrictions? And how will the decisions here impact our national security and our economic prosperity? Yeah, trade-offs is exactly the right way to put it. And I have written about this and I talk about it in terms of playing defense and playing offense. So I would say that the Trump administration should get some credit for raising the alarm that we need to pay attention to this. We're not just purely in a cooperative relationship with China where we send our chips there and they get assembled into our smartphones and everything, but there's more here. But most of what the Trump administration did is what I would call playing defense. They tried to build a moat around US technology. They reformed, for example, CFIUS, which is a law that makes it possible for the US government to restrict foreign investment in the US if there was a national security implication. That law used to be very narrow. And in 2017, 2018, 
they, Congress made it a bit broader to encompass other things the Chinese were doing, like investing in VCs that had really substantial investments in artificial intelligence and getting the intellectual property for that. So those types of things. That's very important. The Trump administration also put in place very tough export controls. I'll go into detail in that in a minute. But it was basically keeping US tech in and Chinese money out, right? And to some extent, we'll talk about this too, keeping Chinese researchers out. So stopping some of the collaboration. That's defense. And I think now you ask Hank, what's the Biden administration doing? They're still debating, exactly as you said. They have kept a lot of the defensive things the Trump administration created in place for now. And some of that's good. Some of that I would argue is a little bit overreach. And they're starting to think about the offensive positive. What do we do to build ourselves up instead of just um, tearing the Chinese down? So I would just say so far, we're about eight months into the Biden administration, still more defensive than offensive. It's become very apparent, so that's one. Two, it's become very apparent that the US government doesn't quite have the existing tools. We're not perfectly organized for this contest. So it's a little bit of a hodgepodge of policies. Three, many of the Trump era policies, I would argue are overbroad and actually in some ways harm our own competitiveness and technology companies. And the Biden administration doesn't yet have senior people in place to make those policies more nuanced. And four, and this is offense, we'll talk about it in a little bit, big, big appropriations are happening by the US Congress, billions and billions of dollars going into R&D, going to shoring up semiconductors. And so it'll just be important now um, to spend that money wisely. Yeah, so Anya, I think you've said that very well on the defensive side. And my concern, is that we may have, in most cases, have you know, identified the problem or the threat, but that in a number of remedies that are being considered, we may end up hurting the United States and our competitiveness more than we hurt China. And we need to be realistic and pragmatic, in particular when we think about allies and how they're going to respond. So I think you said it very well, and I'd like to now go on the offensive side, because as you said, under the Trump administration, and even today, much of U.S.-China technology conversation in Washington focuses on the threat, right? The defensive side. Yep. And I think there's even some hyperbole there, but the threats more or less have been identified. But how can we get back to playing offense? And you've written about this, you've talked about this. What are the most important policies in the U.S. that we should be taking domestically and internationally to enhance our economic competitiveness? Yep. What action should we be taking to maintain leadership in science and technology? Absolutely. Those are absolutely the key questions. Let me start by just explaining to our audience a little bit of what's happening on the defensive side and why, as you said, some of it may actually be harming us. Right, so export controls is the perfect example. It's a really esoteric issue that a few nerdy lawyers like me and others follow. What we've essentially done is made it very hard to export high level technology from the US to China. That's okay in some ways, but many of our industries, and I'll use semiconductors because it's such a key example when we talked about the four key technologies. We made it really hard to send our most advanced chips to China, and especially the machines. <laughs> we are the foremost country in creating semiconductor manufacturing equipment with the Netherlands and Korea and some others. So we build the machines that make the chips. We have made it virtually impossible for our companies to export that. The problem is what they were doing is sending really old technology, like 1990s technology to China, getting the money for that and investing that money in the US to do the most cutting edge advanced research and development on the new stuff that we need. So now if we don't allow them to export the old stuff, where is the money gonna come from for that R&D? That's just one example on how these defensive actions can be real 
overreach. So some is important, but too much of it actually ends up harming it. Let me go to offense, which you so nicely just talked about. And it's exactly right. We need to be focusing on what we can do to stay in the lead rather than just keeping China down. We've done some really good things in that area already. One, the Biden administration is beginning the process of reshaping the US government because boy, are we not set up for this kind of contest. We don't have a tech ministry. <laughs> we have the Department of Commerce, which hasn't traditionally been that. Thank God we have Secretary Gina Raimondo who's really taken on these issues and wants to do the right thing here and wants to learn, wants us to be in the lead. Jake Sullivan, who's our national security advisor, created a deputy national security advisor for technology to kind of coordinate what the US government does on these issues. There's an office of science and technology policy which has been reinvigorated. So we're trying, we're cranking up this machine of the US government and our listeners shouldn't underestimate how hard it is to do that and how hard it is to get organized for that. So that's one offensive mission. Two, and this is really important, we're starting to spend money. So in June, the Senate passed what's called the U.S. Innovation and Competition Act. It passed the Senate by a huge bipartisan margin, which is great. It hasn't been taken up by the House yet. There's a lot in that bill, but I think the most important things to know are there's a lot of money for the National Science Foundation to do really basic research and development. Hank, I think you and I were both at a conference that you led where someone talked about basic R&D. One dollar invested in basic R&D has five dollars of benefit to society. So if we're going to spend U.S. government money, that's where we should be doing it. The new bill doesn't have quite as much money in that as I would have hoped, but it's pretty good. Also, as part of this new bill is what they call the CHIPS Act. So that's $52 billion to help semiconductors specifically, this important technology, both to bring some manufacturing plants back to the US so we have a domestic capability and also to help our companies do the cutting edge research that we know in that. So 50 billion, let me just tell you about this. 50 billion sounds like a whole lot of money, but in that industry, that's four months of capital spent. So even all of these billions that we're now starting to spend we need to spend them very, very wisely or they'll just be wasted. And China is actually a case in point here. China has spent over a hundred billion for sure. Some people say multiple hundred billions. I'm not sure that's quite right. To help China's major semiconductor companies catch up because they're really on to this competition. And most of that money has been wasted. So let's just make sure we don't do the same thing. And then of course, the other things we need to be doing to strengthen ourselves is keep doing what we're good at. We're really amazing at university research. We attract the best international talent from all around the world. And those are the things we need to keep doing. Yep, and I really wanna to get to that because one way that the Trump administration tried to reduce technology transfer was to restrict the flow of Chinese students and researchers. What impact is this having and what do you think is a right path forward here? And more broadly, Anya, talk about the role of immigration as it relates to American tech leadership. Yeah, I would love to do that. Thank you for going there. You know, we are strong because we are international. If you look at the scientific and engineering papers that get most sites around the world, they're almost always international collaboration. And frankly, often between the US and China. <laughs> Not always, but often. So the idea that we should shut this down, I think is not what we should be doing. It is true that the Trump administration cracked down really hard and like often in these things, there is some truth there. Some Chinese scholars were coming to the US and were being encouraged by their government to spy and in some cases actually spying. I believe that that is a minority of even Chinese scientists who are here. But we drew a very broad policy and basically discouraged a lot of people from coming. The FBI was on university campuses, you know, digging into things, making sure, you know, kicking people off campus, in some cases prosecuting them, in some cases rightfully so, and in some overreach. So that's why this is hard. And Hank, you, of course, led the U.S. government at the highest levels 
you know how hard it is in the US government to, to make nuanced policy, <laughs> right? We're good at, at bad guys and good guys. We're not very good at nuance. And that's exactly what's required here. So American universities already have standards on conflict of interest, like how labs could, should conduct themselves, how researchers should conduct themselves. We do need to make sure that those are really well enforced, that people aren't naive. We need to frankly train both our students and university professors in what's going on, explain that there is an actual issue, there is spying, and explain to people that if they are caught doing this, they'll be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law and may end up in jail. But that if they're not spying, they're welcome here, right? So this is a policy of nuance. And then let me say something about your second point, which is role of immigration as it relates to American tech leadership. It's critical. I live out here in Silicon Valley. Look at the immigrants who lead our companies here. Right? Satya Nadella, I think, is an immigrant. Sundar Pichai is an immigrant. Sergey Brin, who founded Google, is an immigrant. The founders of WhatsApp were immigrants. The list goes on and on and on. It is critical that we make sure we don't break that immigration engine. And it's one of the key ways that we stay in the lead. Yeah, Anya, I, I just think this is one of the most important issues where the government has done some damage. You know, shone a light on a problem, but the problem wasn't a huge problem. When you look at it, you know, all of the research that's done, you know, for national security purposes directly in the labs, there are already all kinds of provisions protecting that. There's a lot of research that's open source research, right? And so that's being done and you, know, you don't want to stop that or we won't be participating in international collaborations. So there's a relatively small amount that, of research that's not for the government, not national security, that's really commercially relevant. And as you said, there's a lot that the universities can do to clean that up and uh, make it better. But, right. uh, and yeah. also, you know, we should be, there's one piece, your point just raised it for me, if it's classified research, we should be doing it in our national labs, not yeah, in yeah. universities, yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> and keep that separate. But most basic science work should stay open. If you look at Artie Bienenstock, who wrote an article on this with me, who is the head of physics for Stanford for years and years, he was doing a basic physics research with the Soviets all through the Cold War. Science is for everyone. Yeah. And you look at, so even looking at the classified stuff in the national labs, for instance, we right now, you know, at Argonne Lab, the University of Chicago, researchers can no longer collaborate with China on nuclear reactors. So that means we fall behind because where are nuclear reactors being built? They're being built in China, right? And right. so that's a case of uh, closing a door that hurts us. So much of the most important research is being done where there are Chinese scholars in the United States and Chinese scholars who want to stay here, which is another story altogether where we force people to go back because we won't, after we give them a PhD, we, we send them back to their home countries. That's right. So Anya, I'm going to now turn to allies, which is an area where we have a huge advantage over China in the sense that we've got, you know, the strongest, you know, best allies in the world. But how can we better enlist our allies in Europe and in Asia to help us meet the uh, China challenge. Yeah, this is critically important because of course we can't go it alone. Technology doesn't get created in one country and then you can restrict it like a castle with a moat around it. It's often created through international collaborations and much of the best technology doesn't come from the US. It, it comes from the US, it comes from Europe, it comes from our allies in Asia, you know, Japan and South Korea. So we have to cooperate with them. We're beginning to do it, but in very, very small and ad hoc ways. So what I would propose and have written about and, and many others have as well is my colleagues and I have called it a technology tent a loosely affiliated group of countries that works on these issues we've just been talking about together. And the important thing here is not to make it another international organization that puts out papers that nobody reads, nothing formal, 
but a really flexible approach that goes technology by technology. So let me give you an example. For export controls for semiconductor manufacturing equipment, you really only need four countries at the table. You need the United States, you need the Netherlands, you need Japan, and you need South Korea, because those are the four countries that lead in that technology. And you would just say, okay, let's together come up with what's the really key critical stuff that we don't want the Chinese to have, the most cutting edge stuff, and we'll export control that and everything else we can do. On a different issue, equally important, like ethical standards for artificial intelligence, you would bring in a different group of countries, probably the United Kingdom, probably Israel, maybe India, and you would come up with a set of ethical principles that we all agree to follow. And you wouldn't exclude China in this. You say, hey, here's the bar. Could you please rise to meet the bar? So that's why I mean by a flexible approach, but we certainly, there's no way we win this race if we go it alone. Yeah, and you also alluded to something I talk about a lot, which is, and you've talked about with, with CFIUS and so on, how much do we want to restrict? Right. We, we, we want, I, I thought, used the analogy, we want a small yard and a high fence. Right. The most critically important things. But if you try to do too much, you're going to run into a number of problems. You're going to disadvantage the United States. We're going to also end up isolating ourselves, not just from China, but from our allies. That's right. Because our allies all want an economic relationship with China. And you know, they're, they're going to participate in, you know, these global supply chains and we won't be a reliable partner. That's so right. how you do that. And as you said, government doesn't tend to do such a great job at nuance. And right now the politics are such, it's very easy to uh, make the case for restricting more rather than less without understanding or thinking through the full implications of that. Boy, I think that's so right. And, and I would also say, when I hear our members of Congress and, and really people of both political parties talking about China, there's this underlying aura of fear and anger and it feels like we're in a defensive crouch. And that's not how the United States has ever won. We win by being more magnanimous, more open, bigger. We've done this before. <laughs> you know, we won the Cold War. We sent people to the moon. We're capable of this. And we, we don't need to get our act together and build ourselves up already to do it again. And we don't beat China by making ourselves look more like China, right? That's right. We, you know, China, we, we, we have to play to our strengths. Yeah. So I'm now going to go to, to, to young people. You spend a lot of time with young people as a lecturer and a research affiliate at Stanford University. So let's close on you with the advice that you give to students for starting out their careers in today's rapidly changing world. So what do you tell them? Yeah, thank you. You know, lecturing at Stanford is one of my favorite things that I do. I haven't been able to do it for the past two years because I've been just too busy but there is nothing more wonderful than engaging with the people who are just starting out their careers and who are so altruistic and so wanting to make a positive difference. And what I say to my students and what I'd say to all of you is, please don't give up. Right now, it often feels like the government can't do anything right. We're hopelessly deadlocked. The problems are enormous. You know, we just talked about China, but of course, Hank, you spend a lot of time on climate change, which is becoming more and more acute. It feels a little futile. It feels hard right now, but it's up to all of us, you know, Hank's and my generation, your generation to change all that. And you can, it just takes people coming together. And I'm always so encouraged. You know, Stanford has gotten a reputation of people wanting to go there and then starting the next big unicorn and the race to a billion dollars. That's not what I see in my students. And that's not what I see in really the young people I interact with all around the country. People want to do something positive. So if you're in the private sector, find a way to work with the U.S. government. Find a way to do something useful. I had three tech companies approach me in the last couple of weeks and say, we can help with Afghan refugee vetting. Can you help us put in touch with the right people? That's exactly the kind of spirit we need. And then at some point in your life, please do public service. 
it's important. It helps for the private sector to understand government, government to understand the private sector. And I think it's important for all of us who've been given so much to do our fair part to give back. You know, Anya, what a great note to end on. And that's something that is distinctive about the US, you know, being able to go from the private sector to government right. and back again. And it helps both. So thank you very much for being with us today. You've covered a lot of ground and you've done an excellent job of helping our listeners understand why technology is really ground zero of the US-China economic competition. And as you said, there's it's nothing new. Technology has been ground zero for a long time of economic competition, but boy, in today's world, it's a lot more complex and moving a lot quicker. And you've uh, really given us some uh, very important insights. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. I really appreciated it. And thank you for doing these podcasts. They're enormously informative. You have listened to Straight Talk with Hank Paulson, a podcast of the Paulson Institute. To find more episodes from leading thinkers and doers, please visit paulsoninstitute.org backslash straight talk or download on Apple, Google Play, Spotify, and Stitcher. And don't forget to rate and subscribe. Thank you for listening and see you next time.